range, efficiency, charging speed, battery capacity. What should you look for when you're buying your first EV? Which is the most important and it's probably not the one you're thinking. I'm Dave, welcome to Dave Takes It On. Now, if you buy a £200,000 Lamborghini or Ferrari and drive it around like Lewis Hamilton at Silverstone, then economy is probably not an important factor to you. But most of us try to balance economy with practicality. The most efficient petrol car might be a Toyota Igo, but it's absolutely of little use if you've got a family of five and you go on regular camping trips where you need a huge boot space. So I would put economy, efficiency, battery size, charging speed, put all that on the back burner when you're starting to look. Your priority, go and find your ideal size, get your features and get the price right first. Don't forget, by the way, if you're leasing or financing over two, three or four years, then make sure it will still cope as your children, if you have any, grow up and out, whichever way. So once you've produced a short list of suitable size EVs within your budget, now is the time when I start to make a comparison between the different makes and models. And at this point, range, efficiency, charging speed and battery size assume greater importance. So let's have a look at those and what you should actually look at. Well, let's take range first. That's the question most asked about an EV. What's its range? How far can it go? So what is range? It's quite simply, if you fill your battery or fuel tank completely full, then range is how far your car can travel before the tank or the battery is totally empty. And far too many people choose range as one of the most important factors when considering which EV to buy. In fact, it is almost certainly one of the last things you should consider. Let me explain. To make a car go further, it's really easy. You just put in a larger fuel tank or a bigger battery. If you double the size of your tank or your battery, your car will go roughly twice as far. So why do the fuel tanks and batteries normally have a smaller size than what you might want? Well, the answer to that is space and weight. If you put in a battery that's twice the size, it'll be twice the weight. It will also take up twice the space. Now, a heavier car will also use more fuel to travel the same distance as a lighter one. So installing a larger battery is not the ideal way of extending the range that your car can drive. I mean, for example, can you imagine buying a petrol car that's lost more than half its boot space because there's a massive big petrol tank in there? So all manufacturers have to compromise. They want to give you a reasonable range, but not one that is reasonably um, seriously affecting the weight of the car or the available space. Now, for most petrol cars, you'll find a range of three, four hundred miles, maybe some of them going up to about 500. With an EV, you can find ranges very much smaller than that. Some of the budget cars are down at 50 or 60 miles, most of them well over 100. And then in the real world, the majority you'll get between two and 300 miles. Because the simple fact is, most people don't use their cars for really long journeys on a regular basis. So the average tank battery size suits most people. Now in the EV world, nearly all manufacturers will offer a model with a longer range for those who do those longer distances or travel distances on a regular basis. So for many, it'll be tempting to just go for the longer range and pay more money. But if you only ever use your car for commuting 10 or 20 miles a day and only do one or two long journeys every year, then you will have spent a lot more money for something that you don't actually use. So when you're looking at range for most people, anything above 200 mile is probably perfectly adequate. Because here we have to look at efficiency. Once again, really simple terms, efficiency is how well or poorly the engine uses the fuel. Most of us understand miles per gallon. It's what we've been living with for all of our driving lives. And so we know that a car that can travel 
40 miles on a gallon of petrol is twice as efficient as an identical car with a different engine that can only travel 20 miles on a gallon of petrol. And exactly the same applies in the EV world. A car that can travel 4 miles for every kilowatt hour of battery it has is probably around about twice as efficient as an EV that can only travel 2 miles on each kilowatt hour. So if your car does only travel two miles on each kilowatt hour of battery storage, it's really easy and tempting for the manufacturer to hide that by just putting in a battery of twice the size. In that case, the range of both these cars would then be the same. But the difference here is it would be much more expensive to buy. Batteries are a big part of the cost. And when you recharge the battery, the larger one, it'll take up to twice as long to fill it up and it would cost twice as much for the electricity that you put into it. So covering up an inefficient car by just adding a larger battery is something you definitely want to watch out for. The measure of efficiency that most of us in the EVE world use will be not miles per gallon, but miles per kilowatt hour. So if your car's got a 50 kilowatt hour battery and your car achieves four miles per kilowatt hour, then the range is going to be around about 200 miles. If your EV has a 100 kilowatt hour battery and your car achieves only two miles per kilowatt hour, range is exactly the same, 200 miles. So the range itself is not so important. You don't want to rely on it. It's just a number and it's nowhere near as important as the efficiency. Efficiency in an EV is best measured in the number of miles you can travel for each kilowatt hour of storage that your battery has. And the miles per kilowatt hour are normally clearly advised in the specification. Alternatively, uh, we'll put some links down below, but there are numerous websites which will quote all of the popular EVs and the efficiency that is quoted by the manufacturer. And then usually they put one alongside that, which is what you actually get in the real world. And they are different. You'll know this if you've ever bought a petrol car brand new, you'll know that there was a big sticker in the window saying this car will get X miles per gallon on the combined cycle. They never do. And that's because the tests they use are carried out under absolutely ideal conditions. They're useful nevertheless because they allow you to compare one make or model against another. So forget the actual miles per kilowatt hour they quote, instead have a look at how many it achieves compared to another car you might be looking at. Well, look at the battery size, look at the efficiency. And if you multiply it too, you'll get the uh, approximate range of the car. And you then compare both of those with another car that's on your shortlist. If economical running costs are important to you, then the smaller battery with a higher efficiency is much better than a larger battery with lower efficiency. Today, the average family car will achieve, in the real world, around four miles per kilowatt hour. Some of the more efficient models will get up to five, some of them heading up towards six miles, while the less efficient models may be down as slow as three or sometimes even two miles per kilowatt hour. So in really simple terms, a car doing just two miles per kilowatt hour will use approximately three times as much electricity as a similar car size weight and everything else uh, as one doing six miles per kilowatt hour. But now we need to bring into this charging speed because while petrol pumps always pump out petrol at roughly the same rate, EV chargers do not. And while most petrol cars can happily accept as however much fuel is pumped into them through the petrol pumps, most EVs cannot. If you can charge your car at home, it doesn't matter how fast or slow the car charges. Plug it in before you go to bed, wake up in the morning, you've got a full battery. It's totally irrelevant when it actually reached the full stage and stopped charging. But when you're out on a road trip, how long it takes to charge is much more important. Most people on the road trip would not like to wait two or three hours for their car to charge. So the third major element we need to look at is how quickly you can refill your battery when it gets down to nearly empty. Now, when you get to an EV charger, it will normally have the power output printed somewhere on the charger itself or a label alongside. If it doesn't, it will always be shown on your EV display or on the route planner or on an app on your smartphone. There's always a way of finding the size. The power of an EV charger is rated in kilowatts. 
So just to clarify, kilowatt, kilowatts is a measure of power, kilowatt hours is a measure of storage. So out on the road, the power of the chargers you're most likely to come across range from about 50 kilowatts right up to about 360 kilowatts. Huge range. And while it might be tempting to head for the most powerful charger you can find, you do need to know how fast your car can accept electricity when you're charging. Once again, this is a figure that is quoted in the specification and is usually shown as maximum charging speed, believe it or not. This can in some cars be as little as three kilowatts and as much as 350 kilowatts. And that's a huge range. The average maximum charging speed for most family cars is hovering somewhere around about 100, 150 kilowatts. Now, just to clarify, EVs and EV chargers operate very much like your home electricity supply and the appliances you plug in. At home, you can happily just plug in a three kilowatt tech kettle into a socket and the kettle will take three kilowatts. You can also plug in a five watt LED lamp and it will only take five watts. So in your house, it's perfectly safe and acceptable to plug any device into a socket and that device will only take as much power as it needs. Exactly the same applies to your EV. It is perfectly safe to plug your EV into any power charger and your EV will only take what it can use. So if you're the owner of an EV that can only charge at 30 kilowatts and you plug that into a 350 kilowatt charger, your car will happily and safely charge, but it will only accept the 30 kilowatts as its maximum. You cannot damage your car or the charger by plugging it in to a higher power EV charger. I give lots of examples and it can get quite confusing, but what you've got to realize is when you've chosen the EV you're going to buy or lease, you only have to ever deal with one after that. So if you've chosen the car with a 50 kilowatt hour battery, uh, that's what you've got. So you now only concentrate on your car. This is trying to cover all of them. Now, bit of a spoiler alert here in that if your car can accept 100 kilowatts maximum charging speed, it won't do it. It'll never do that. At any point while you've got the car, it will never do it. And it certainly won't do it continuously throughout the charging session. The maximum charging speed that is quoted is the maximum it could possibly do, the maximum it can safely do, and it would usually have restrictions in the design circuitry, like fuses, trips or whatever, that will stop it doing any more. So it'll never go above this. So regard this as the absolute maximum you could ever achieve, you won't. So why doesn't it charge at the maximum charging speed throughout the entire charging session? Well, a battery is simply a container full of various chemicals that when you put electricity into them, it stores the energy. When you connect a load to it, a motor for example, it releases the energy. So the first factor to consider how quickly it can do this is temperature. If the battery is absolutely stone ice cold, it can only accept the power at a slower rate because the chemical reaction to take the electricity and turn it into storage proceeds slower. And compared to obviously if your battery is nice and warm, it'll go faster. But likewise, if a battery is empty, it can accept that power at a faster rate than if the battery is nearly full. One of the best analogies I've ever heard is to think of you charging your battery a bit like parking in a multi-storey car park. If the car park is absolutely empty, you can drive in and just instantly find a parking space right in front of you. Really quick, you park, you're out, it's no time at all. As the car park fills up, it's going to take you longer and longer as you look for the first vacant space. It doesn't take very long, but you will travel further. And it'll take longer. Now, when the car park is almost totally full, it's going to take a long time. You might drive around a couple of times looking for the last one or two vacant spaces. Your battery is exactly the same. When it's empty, the electrons coming in can almost instantly be stored, no looking around. But when it's nearly full, it will take longer to store those last few electrons. This is important to understand. So to achieve the maximum from your car, the maximum charging speed that your car will be able to get is will be if your battery is almost empty and it's also nice and warm. So when you're choosing EV, the battery size is not as important as the efficiency. 
and the range is not as important as either the efficiency or the maximum charging speed. Well, I hope some of this is making sense to you. I hope it helps you in the choice of your first EV. It can quite seem quite a daunting experience. But don't forget, you don't have an EV. You've probably never driven one. You would certainly never actually charge one or worked out how efficient it is or how fast they can charge. So this is all going to be a learning curve for you. Not only will the car be different, the active filling it or charging the battery is also very different from filling your tank. But once you've had the car for a couple of weeks or months, done charging, you've done a few miles, um, it all becomes second nature to you. Well, anyhow, thanks very much for watching. I'm Dave. I do hope you have enjoyed this video and it's helped you in some way. If you have liked it, please click the like button. And if you'd like to see more like this, please subscribe. If you click the notification bell, we'll notify you whenever we launch a new video. Massive thank you to our Patreon members. Details for that are down below. Without your support, we would not be able to do an awful lot of what we do. So thanks again. I'm Dave.